has anybody been to Brooklyn Historical Society before? Yeah. Good. Oh my gosh, that's so great to see. I've seen you there, yes. <laughs> it's very close. So th those who don't have their hands raised have very little excuse. Um, we're located on 128 Pierpont Street, just around the corner. I mean, you could take somersault there. Um, but we are a 150, almost 155-year-old history institution. We're dedicated to the preservation of Brooklyn's history and to educating diverse audiences about all that it tells us, not just about Brooklyn, but about the country in a lot of ways, the world. Um, we have our own interesting history, and one exciting moment in that history is that, as Sarah said, we, are, we have just opened a second location on the Brooklyn waterfront in the neighborhood of Dumbo. Um, in a really remarkable building that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in a second. And I am excited to come here and tell you a little bit, little bit about some of the stories that we uncovered in putting together not just the very bricks and mortar of that museum, but the long-term exhibition waterfront um, that we have installed in there. And so um, after you come to 128 Pierpont to our very beautiful St. Anne's style building, you can take a brief walk down a hill to the waterfront and learn about a very different story and a very different vision of Brooklyn that took place there. So let's talk a little bit about waterfront. So this is a landmark exhibition for us. This was part of a very big initiative of our institution committing to the study of the waterfront, not just in terms of its history, which is of course at the heart of what we do, but of course the waterfront is where many of the debates about Brooklyn's future are occurring and tie into issues of equity, gentrification, but also of course environmental history, the issue of global sea rise, issues of environmentalism. So many debates about Brooklyn's future center around our coastline and what we are going to be doing with it in the next decades and centuries in a lot of ways. And so uh, this is very much an extension of Brooklyn Historical Society's mission because in a lot of ways there, you cannot understand the future without looking at the past. And in a lot of ways, there's no point in telling, us telling you about the past unless we can make you see how salient it is to the present that you live in and to the future that we're all planning. So we wanted to do a lot of things with this exhibition. We wanted to be very ambitious. But most importantly, I think we wanted to capture a balance. We wanted to tell a local story. We're an institution that's very committed to place-based history. We want you to walk outside of this building or go down to the waterfront and see not just what you see, but to see the vestiges of the past um, in the place that you're standing. But of course, Brooklyn's story is not a provincial one. Um, it is a borough, once a city, now a borough, that has had enormous influence, global influence. And that is very much the case for the waterfront, as we're going to see. And so we wanted to make a very careful balance of telling you hyper-local stories and also showing you the role that Brooklyn plays in a, a web of global commerce that spans across the globe. So this is what you'll see when you walk into our beautiful new museum. Um, the exhibition opened in January. Um, it's the culmination of about four years of intensive research on the part of my team, which is very much a luxury for us. Not all curators get to spend that much time looking into one topic, and so it was really wonderful. And it was a hard job because um, there's a lot of stories in the waterfront, and we had to actually figure out not just which ones we were going to tell, but which ones we weren't able to tell. And we also, when we're making those decisions, have to take a lot of things into consideration. And one of those is the expectations of our visitors. And we knew we would be getting a lot of visitors and very diverse visitors. Visitors coming with an idea of what they want to see. And visitors also coming and we wanted, in a way that we wanted to sort of teach them new things about the waterfront. So what's one thing, if you were coming to our exhibition about the waterfront, that you would expect, one story that you might expect to learn about in our museum? Any ideas? Something iconic about the waterfront? Sorry? Why is it called the waterfront? What is a waterfront? That's a great question. Other historic moments in the history of our waterfront that might come to mind? Absolutely. People who lived and shaped the waterfront right in back of you. 9-11. Oh, that's really interesting. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> that's very interesting. Sorry, ma'am? World War II. World War II. Absolutely. The Navy Yard, iconic Brooklyn story. Yes, sir? Sugar, absolutely. Another one that I'm going to add to that, oh, sir, yes? Uh, 
I could talk about that for a long time, but that was a hard, that's a hard sell. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw one else, uh, another one into the bucket, the Brooklyn Bridge, right? It's right outside of where our museum is. Everybody wants to know about that. So there are these iconic stories, some of which that you've mentioned, that we felt that we needed to tackle. But another important part of our mission is telling stories that, we, that people don't know. And that gets to your point right there, which is to tell the stories of the people who shaped the waterfront. People like Nelson Rockefeller, you know, people like um, the Pierpont, these big names, they have absolutely shaped the waterfront. But the other people who have shaped the waterfront are just countless and nameless working people who lived and worked along the waterfront for decades. So it was really important for us to capture that mix to tell the big stories that you're expecting to hear, but also to surprise you. And to that end, we talk about everything from oyster men who were fishing in sewage-infested waters in Jamaica Bay at the turn of the century. We talk about women working in the Navy Yard in World War II, just like this um, woman pointed out, and to tell their stories through their own voice using our oral history collections. Um, but there are so many other people, especially when we go back to the 19th and the 18th centuries, which we're going to focus on today, who left almost no sort of mark on the historical record. And yet their stories are so important. And how do we bring those to life? And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means today. So I just also want to tell you a little about the building that we're in, because we took a lot of cues and the stories that we wanted to tell from our building. So we are located in a about 300,000 square foot Ni um, 19th century brick warehouse located along Brooklyn's waterfront. We didn't get all 300,000 square feet. <laughs> we only got 3,000 square feet, but we'll take it. Um, we are actually the only cultural institution that's represented in this building, which um, actually sat empty along the Brooklyn waterfront for about 70 years before it was redeveloped beginning in 2014, opened in 2017, as a largely commercial center. So you can find restaurants there, you can find stores there. There are a large number of offices there. The West Elm Company, which many of you are familiar with, that's, this is their new corporate headquarters. So it's significant that we're the only cultural institution that's represented there. We are really the sole people there that are tasked with telling the story of this building and revealing the history of this building, which if we weren't there, would be largely seen as a commercial center. Um, and that's an interesting twist on its history. But of course, Dumbo, the neighborhood it's in, is a very different place now than it was 20 years ago or 200 years ago. And we wanted to tell those different iterations of that neighborhood and to teach people how to find vestiges of that in the past. So you can see we've got a stellar waterfront location, um, and you should definitely um, come down and see us. Another important task for us is thinking of a very broad and diverse audience, and we mean this in many, many ways. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a, like a classically trained historian. I got a PhD, and a lot of my colleagues become professors, and they talk to wonderful audiences like you, and they write books, and this is an amazing, like it's just an amazing opportunity to reach people. And one of the challenges of being a curator is that we have to reach you, and we have to reach this little guy. Um, and we have to reach people coming in who don't speak English because they're visiting from France. And we have to reach in an, a huge swath of people who are coming in with very different backgrounds and understandings and preconceived notions about what they're going to see here. And we want to please and offer something to offer th to, to all of them. And we want to make sure that all of them walk away with a salient understanding of history's importance. And this is a particular challenge in this location because of the commercial nature of the space. People come to this building to buy a pillow <laughs> or to get like a $5 cup of coffee, um, and, you know, as coffee cups tend to be in, in Dumbo these days. How can we appeal to him, but also to appeal to people who are coming to have rich, um, you know, many hours interactions with history? Um, and we had to be very creative, not just in the stories that we chose, but the way that we chose to tell those stories. So I showed you a picture of Empire Stores today. This is what Empire Stores looked like in the 1890s. Today, the Empire Stores building is one of the last remaining 19th century commercial warehouses that exist along the Brooklyn's waterfront. Back when this picture was taken, it was one of about 70 warehouses that we've been able to identify through newspaper records, through atlases, through many other documents. 
um, in order to put together the story of the part of Brooklyn that we now call the wall, that was called at the time, the walled city. One of the reasons people called Brooklyn the walled city in the 19th century is because if you were standing um, looking at the waterfront from the, the side of a boat, it would have looked like a fortress of brick warehouses stretching three miles along Brooklyn's waterfront. It was essentially a fortress of capitalism, a fortress of commerce. This was the sort of headquarters of where goods were brought into New York Harbor and stored. Now, of course, there were warehouses in Manhattan. There were warehouses in a lot of other places. But Brooklyn, in the early 19th century, its waterfront was largely undeveloped. And it was a perfect time to build these kinds of massive warehouses along the waterfront. It's pretty intense. <laughs> Um, in a way that was much more efficient than the crowded and rundown piers of Manhattan. So billions of dollars a year of goods were being stored along Brooklyn's waterfront and warehouses like this by the mid-19th century. And we're very lucky um, that this warehouse was able to survive. In a lot of ways, the warehouses that did survive, um, survived because of neglect. Um, they were abandoned. They were passed down from owner to owner. In the case of the Empire Stores, it was owned by Con Ed for a while and they wanted to tear it down to sort of extend their holdings along the waterfront. Luckily, the area was landmarked in the 1970s, um, but debates continued to rage about what would happen to it until it, the redevelopment began in 2014. Now that said, we wanted to look at the history of not just the building, but the site itself. It wasn't always a site of storage, and this is a picture of almost the exact same place that I just showed you, but in 1819. In 1819, the area that we today know as Dumbo was a residential and commercial and industrial area. It had a very mixed group of residents. Um, there were people of, who were native to the United States. There were also lots of immigrants. We had a large number of Irish and German immigrants gathering here. And this was also the home to the first free black community in Brooklyn. Actually, at a time, this, is, this photo, I'm um, sorry, this painting was, um, was um, done eight years before the end of slavery in New York State. And so even before the slavery ends in, in Brooklyn and in New York State, there is already a growing and thriving community of African Americans who are living in the area that we today know as Dumbo. We wanted to tell their stories in the exhibition to get at, again, exactly the theme that you raised, the idea that there were countless people who built the buildings of the waterfront, established the businesses and the institutions of the waterfront, whose stories largely go untold because they're very difficult to find in the historical record. And we also wanted to show through a series of human profiles that slavery and freedom are not simple and black and white things. You aren't just free or just a slave. And especially in northern states like New York, where there was a process of gradual emancipation, where people had the opportunity to sometimes buy their own freedom or to work towards their own freedom, there were various sort of stages and experiences of freedom and unfreedom that took place. But how do we find these people? How do we tell their stories? And I think most importantly, how do we make them interesting to that cute kid that I showed you a, a few slides back, as well as a broad audience? One of the things that is really exciting to me as a historian and a curator is thinking about exhibitions, not just as like artifacts that you see or beautiful celebrated paintings, but about more mundane pieces like the one that we're looking at. These are, this is a manuscript document from 1798. This is the bread and butter of what historians do. These are the documents that we use and analyze to put together the stories that we tell, especially when looking at the 18th and 19th centuries. But this is, a, this is not an easy thing to tackle, right? I put this in front of you, and it's like, whoa, what do I do with this? I mean, I bet a lot of you are like, I can't even read that, so stop right there. Um, the research that we've done as curators show us that maybe 5% of people coming into a museum who are confronted with this document will even attempt to read something like this, right? So put, just telling you, this is important. You should read it and then giving it to you is not uh, nearly enough um, to sort of unlock it and show you the stories that we find in it. So it's our job as curators to figure out a way to tell you about this. 
Now I'm here today to tell you about it like in person, but I'm not always in the gallery. The gallery's open right now. <laughs> I'm not there to tell everybody who's going into our exhibit how to look through this. And so we need to think about creative and physical ways to bring documents like this to life. This looks like a mundane document, but it actually, it's sort of ordinariness belies the fact that there is a heartbreaking story that's embedded in this document. And I want to talk you through that story today. So we are looking at an, uh, the front page of an account book from a 1798 auction that took place on a waterfront estate near, actually near where the Navy Yard is today, near the Wallabout Bay area. There was a man named John Cohen Hohen. He came from a very established family in Brooklyn. They can trace their roots back to the mid-17th century. Um, but from what I've gathered in my research, he was a bit of a gambler, he was a spender, and he found himself enormously in debt in 1798 in such dire straits that he had to sell off his entire estate at what appeared to be a massive three or four day auction. And when you look at the roster and the amounts of things that are sold here and the amount of money that was gained, you can see just how much debt this guy was in. He was still alive, so he's there watching his entire estate get liquidated, right? So we look through this and we can see lots of things. We can see, you know, I'm just looking at here, th this right here. We can see that there are um, tools from the farm that was nearby. We can see that there's a lot of household goods as we look through things like spoons, teapots, a lot of silver, uh, furniture that they're selling. And then on like the seventh page in, we come across this listing. So I'm just gonna come right up here and show you. Right here, we have a listing of five African-American people who were sold um, in this estate sale. Um, we don't know what day, of the, uh, what day of the auction that they were sold. We don't know if they knew that it was coming, but we can learn a lot about their experiences here. And the thing that particularly struck me as a historian, I'm just gonna read you the, their names. We have Negro Boy Neen, and then this little thing that you see right here, that's, that's D-O, so it's like ditto. So it, it's like a, one of these underneath it. So then we have Negro Man Harry, Negro Woman Bet, Negro Boy Prince, and Old Negro Man Harry. And I was struck by Bet, because Bet is the only woman here. And it's so difficult to find out stories about enslaved people in the 18th and 19th century, but it's really difficult to find out about the stories of women. And what did this experience look like if we made this book not about John Cohen Hohen, the guy whose stuff was getting sold off, but if we made the story about Bet? What can we learn just from this one entry around, about Bet? Let's look at it a little bit more closely together. So we can see that Bet um, was sold for five shillings. You guys see that right there? Five shillings. Let's look at the people who are with her here. Negro Boy Prince was sold for 65 pounds. Um, Negro Boy Neen was sold for 50 pounds. Harry was sold for 45 pounds. That was sold for five shillings. If we go on to the next few pages, we see that there were tea sets that were sold for more than that. So there are a lot of things that we can kind of infer about this. Likely Bet was quite old. Um, at the end of her life, which I think it, it, it makes her story particularly poignant to see her life and her family kind of broken up at the very end of her life. Now, in the second column, we see the people that they were sold to. What's notable here about who they were sold to, to you guys? Sorry? Paul Hemus, another Brooklyn name that we see. What else do you guys notice about who... The, who said that? One more time. They're all different. Every single one of these people was sold to a different owner. They were separated, essentially, after this day. I also noticed that it seems to me like there are, there are three generations of people who are represented here. We have old Negro man Harry. He also is only sold for two pounds, by the way. And we have Bet. That's right, right. I mean, of course, it's all awful. But um, yes, exactly. Um, and we have old Negro man Harry, we have Bet, who we now assume was old or infirm in some way. Then we have Harry, who's just a Negro man. And then we have the listing of two boys, right? We've got Prince and Neen, and they're sold for the most. 
This to me looks like the outline of a three generational family living in the Cohen Hohen household until this day. Were they technically related? I don't know. Actually, there's probably no way we can ever know. But certainly this was a group of people who would have formed the structures of a family in order to survive this life of enslavement along the waterfront. And here we basically have the severing of this family on this particular day on April 1798. So there's something to me that is like really powerful about the story that was told in this that is juxtaposed with the very stark economic and legal language behind this auction and how could we bring this to life for people. One last thing and then here's just an example of some of the other things that were sold. These things also went to Theodorus Polhemus who was the, the man who bought Bet. So he bought, you know, besides Bet, tea tongs, soup ladles, spoons, jars, bowls, dishes, plates. You took a lot of stuff away from this auction and again the kind of the like depravity of comparing these things to a human being very, are, is a very powerful uh, thing in this document. Yes. It's another very interesting point. It's really something that you see played out in our archives over and over. We see the use of pounds in Brooklyn until uh, the first decade of the 19th century. This is something that you see in a lot of places in the United States after the Revolutionary War, but particularly in places that are more rural. And although, of course, we live in a bustling urban center today, in the, at the turn of the 19th century, Brooklyn was a very, very rural place. You see lots of different currencies used in Brooklyn until the beginning of the 19th century um, for that very reason. We take the idea of currency as something that's very solid for granted today, but really up until the mid-19th century, it was a, a little bit of a, a Wild West uh, kind of thing. And then on the very last page of this, we see one last hurried exchange. We see one more unnamed Negro boy sold for $75. And I don't know what it was about this one. Sorry? 75 pounds, excuse me. 75 pounds. And there's something about this particular one that kind of like just struck me in the gut. It was like one last, more, one last exchange to, to get onto the books here and make sure that we record this, you know? Um, that really hammers home the notion of humans as something that you exchange um, in a document like this. And so basically, to tell this story, as curators, we basically threw out John Cohen Hohen as the center of the story and made Bet the center of our story. We created basically a new book, a new account book, that was the same story from the perspective of Bet. And as you turn through the pages, you have the voice of the historians walking you through exactly as I did, with highlights, with translations, exactly what you should be looking at in a document like this to kind of tell that story from a different point of view. I think there's a powerful irony to looking at a document like an account book this way. This document was created as a record of financial exchange. That's it. And in a lot of ways, when it was donated to our museum, likely in the late 19th century, it was donated for that very reason, as a record of the financial might or the you know, financial loss of this particular very old and established family. From the perspective of the early 21st century, informed by the practices of social history, history from the ground up, we can now use this document in a, actually a really revolutionary way to deprioritize the enslavers and to put agency and power back into the hands and the stories of the people whose stories were never even really meant to be captured in a document like this. So I want to tell you one more story about a person that we discovered in the process of putting together our exhibition from a very different time. We're going to jump forward to the 1870s now. Um, we're going from that kind of, um, that sm smaller, more rural, free black community that we talked about a little bit earlier to, that, to the walled city that I talked about. By 1873, Brooklyn is lined with the warehouses like the Empire Stores. And those warehouses are a place of work for hundreds of thousands of workers, most of whom were underpaid, many of whom were immigrants, and who lived in neighborhoods nearby. Now, today we associate waterfront living with luxury and with high price tags. And that is a very, very new thing. 
Um, in the 19th century, you wanted to live as far from the waterfront as you possibly could because the waterfront was a place of industrial pollution, it was a place of danger, um, and it was a place where you were living close to where you worked and you didn't really want to live close to these kinds of industrial sites. But nonetheless, recently arrived immigrants usually you know, lived in crowded tenement neighborhoods like Vinegar Hill, which is just adjacent to the neighborhood that we now know as Dumbo. And we had the same question, the same challenge. How do we find their stories? How do we highlight their experiences in a way that is really personal and really resonant to people? Well, the digital age makes this a lot easier for historians. So when I got this assignment, learn the history of Empire Stores, the first thing that I did, literally the first thing that I did, was I went to all my newspaper databases and I put you know, Empire Stores in quotes and I hit search, right? And I actually came up with an enormous amount of newspaper material um, about this building. A lot of it was, oh, this shipment is coming in, this shipment is going out, this crime took place there. But I did find this. So, killed by a bag of seed yesterday afternoon while Michael Harkins, aged 45 years, was hoisting bags of seed at the Empire Stores, Brooklyn. One of the bags slipped from its slings and falling about eight feet struck Harkins, throwing him violently to the floor and causing a fracture of his skull. He was taken to his home, number 195 Plymouth Street, where he died in about an hour after the occurrence. So it's a very small listing on a big broadside page. We're very lucky to find this. As historians, there are things that ping off in your head about something like this. What in here do you guys think is evidence that can help me do a further search about Michael Harkins? The address. Excellent. Anything else? Louder. His name. His name? Absolutely. Although, you know, Irish names in the mid 19th century, whew, there's a lot of Michael Harkinses, right? But his name plus his address really helps. Anything else? His age, his age, that's huge, okay? So I've got his address, his name, and his age, and I can kind of go from there. And boy, were we able to go from there. We were able to gather an enormous amount of data about him. So this is like a treasure hunt. I mean, I think this is like really the fun part of being a historian, is that you get these glimpses of data, and you follow them, and lots of times they take you nowhere, and sometimes they take you to remarkable places. And so this became kind of the inspiration for what we wanted to do in another part of the exhibition, which is not just tell you about Michael Harkins, but tell you about how we found Michael Harkins, how historians piece together their lives, to actually empower our visitors to become historians themselves and to analyze the data towards putting together a composite of his life. Well, if you look through the times, it's a great question because they certainly weren't all shown. And actually, things like this, accident jobs, were um, like uh, accidental deaths on jobs were incredibly common in the 19th century. This is an age before OSHA. This is a, an age before anything, any kind of protections of workers. But you actually do see quite a lot of listings like this in the New York Times, in the Daily Eagle at the time. Um, this was the only one I was able to find for Empire Stores, right? Um, which is interesting because no doubt other deaths would have occurred at the Empire Stores, but this was the only one in any newspaper that I was able to find a record of at the particular warehouse that I was researching, but that's a fantastic question. So where did I go from here? Okay, well, the first thing I did based on his name, as I said, he's probably, he was probably an immigrant. And so we were able to use, again, the internet searchability of the National Archives to locate his immigration record. So what can I find out about Michael Harkins from this immigration record? He comes here in October of 1852. He's young, like a lot of Irish people were at the time. He's 22 years old. Um, lots of different kinds of immigration patterns throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, but for a lot of Irish coming in the middle of the 19th century, people came usually single. Um, they came on their own. Um, very different than, say, like Italians that you see coming over at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, some of whom have families that they leave back in Italy, for example, and then bring over once they've established themselves here. But Michael is 22 years old, um, we're inferring that he is single, like a lot of people at the time, but we are able to corroborate that later. We can also see that Michael is a laborer, 
and that he is from Ireland. We see another Scotland below him, but if I zoomed this page out for you, you would see Ireland, 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 Ireland. A massive wave of Irish immigration taking place in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. One of the big push factors is, of course, the potato famine taking place in Ireland at the time. Um, but so we also see that he is a laborer. Again, if we zoomed out the page, we would see a lot of casual work listed as the professions of the people who worked along the waterfront at the time. Okay, so now I know he got here in 1852. From there, I can look at some census records. Now, census records may not look like much, and unfortunately, this one is written very, very fadedly, so I'll just have to read it to you. Um, but census records are just chock, chock full of information. On this document right here, we were able to get an enormous amount of information about Michael. First of all, Censuses are done by household. So we are able to, by 1860, see that it's not just Michael living in his household. He is married. He's married to a woman named Mary. Mary's entrance, which is right below the arrow, right below his, also indicates that she is unable to read or write. So we know that Mary is illiterate. We know that Mary Harkins has a daughter with Michael, also named Mary. A lot of Marys, a lot of Michaels in this family. Um, and then they also have a son named William. Thanks to our, our census uh, data down the road, we were able to determine that William died at a young age, um, probably by the time he was 20 years old. But Mary, as you're going to see, endured, Mary Jr. Um, so we can see that Michael, again, was born in Ireland. So was Mary, um, but that their children were born in New York. So we have now identified the first members of the Harkins family to be born in the United States. This um, census record, as all rec uh, census records, show us where people lived. And so we can also see that he lived at 165 Plymouth Street. As we traced this family, we found that they moved over five times in the next two decades, all to different tenements along Plymouth Street. The Harkinses were never able to, to save enough money to ever own a home. With those addresses, we can do some more interesting research. And what we actually found about this family is that while they were living in two of those residences on Plymouth Street, murders took place in the tenements that they were living in at the time. And this is one Brooklyn Eagle reporting of that very, of, of that very thing. So when they were living at 129 Plymouth Street, this murder took place, murder of a wife. An infuriated husband beats his wife to death in the presence of his children. Details of the sickening scene, arrest of the murderer. And so this goes on to give a lot of very gory detail about this. Um, and this is something that you see very typically in 19th century newspapers, a lot of sensationalist detail about these kinds of murders, but also kind of like this, um, this like undergirding of racism throughout it. So there's a lot of references to the fact that this is an Irish man who is killing his wife. Lots of talk about whiskey drinking. And so playing on these common ethnic stereotypes um, of immigrants being drunkards, being dangerous. But it's interesting, I'm a gender historian, and if you look at this through the lens of gender, I also think there's a lot to be said about how difficult life was probably living along Plymouth Street in the 1860s and 1870s at this time. You were poor, work was not regular, um, the conditions of your housing were terrible. So, you know, Michael's labor would have been significant Mary's labor also would have been enormously backbreaking. It must be enormously difficult and taxing on a marriage to live in conditions like that, um, where you're, where you're, where basically you're, where you're living the next day is not always sure. And so I think it's really interesting to read these stories through that lens as well, the sort of the interpersonal tolls um, that poverty can take on a family over years and decades. One thing that we also know about immigrants is that in many cases, it was women who were the sort of purse strings of the family. They were the ones who established bank accounts and managed a lot of the finances, and we found that that was actually the case for the Harkinses as well. So we're looking here at a bank account record for Mary Harkins, not Michael, Mary. Um, this is three years before Michael's death in 1873. Now this is where our research took a fascinating turn because this tells us that Mary Harkins is the account uh, person, but there's a cosigner a woman named Mary Toomey. Who is Mary Toomey? So we look further down here and we can see that Mary Toomey was born Mary Harkins. 
and that she's married to another Michael. So this is Mary Harkins Jr. And she's 13 years old in this record. So she married at the age of 13 because she was pregnant. And so we found out that but three years before Michael Harkins died, his 13-year-old daughter got pregnant and was married to a man named Michael Toomey. And from there, we were able to piece together essentially five generations of the Harkins Toomey family. Mary, Harkin, Mary Toomey goes on to really be the, become the matriarch of this family. By 1900, they are living in a more comfortable neighborhood out in Clinton Hill. Three generations of Harkins women are living together in that house, Mary Sr., Mary Toomey, and then the daughter that she was pregnant with in the record that I had just showed you. Um, we tried, I cannot tell you how hard, to track down the last Michael Toomey who was born in Queens and who may still be alive today, and were unable to do so before the exhibition opened. But I just am always like tickled to think about what it would be like for him to stumble into our museum and see the story of five generations of his family kind of broken open, all from this document. So this is one of the ways that we wanted to take things, again, that look so mundane and so simple, like a newspaper notice like this, and using the skills of a historian, crack open a remarkable and even dramatic, may I say, story of many generations of as yet unknown Brooklynites who lived along the waterfront. Um, it's even more fun to see in person. And so I hope that you will all come to Brooklyn Historical Society Dumbo and do learn more about people like this in person. You can find out more on our website. And I'm happy to talk to you more about the things I've told you today or the waterfront more broadly. Thanks so much for listening. This is a painting by Francis Guy from 1819. It is hanging in the Brooklyn Museum. A very interesting side story about this is that Francis Guy painted this scene dozens of times. He painted it in the winter. He painted it in the summer. He painted it with people. He painted it without people. And we have the same scene, this exact same position, in the summer with no people in it at our original building at Brooklyn Historical There's Society. So that's why, we, that's why we featured this painting, actually. There's, a num there's actually four African Americans featured in this painting. I sh told you the story of Bette, who is not in this painting. But we, in the exhibition, we also tell the story of a, of a man, basically this man, Samuel Foster, who is sticking his head out of the chimney right there. Similarly to how I told you the stories of the people today, we were able to use census records, newspaper records, and many other things to piece together the story of Samuel Foster's life. His story, I would say, I you know, I hate to use words like happy and sad, but he gains his freedom, and we find him at the end of his life in 1860 with quite a bit of real estate and property to his name, according to the census records. So again, these phases of freedom and unfreedom that people experienced along the waterfront over the course of the 19th century. It's a great question. It's like a, we can do a whole talk on what, is, what we think the waterfront is. So we cover the entire waterfront. So we tell stories about Jamaica Bay. We tell stories about Newtown Creek. And we tell stories about everything in between. 131 miles of waterfront is what we cover in our exhibition. And we also cover about 12,000 years of history in the exhibition. I stuck with just a few stories um, today. But I'm glad you raised the question because it's a really difficult one. Um, 3,000 square feet is not a lot, right? And we had to be very careful about sort of like which stories we were going to tell and which ones we weren't going to tell. I'll tell you a big one that hit the cutting room floor, Coney Island. We talk about the Coney Island very little in this exhibition. And part of the reason that we did that is because we took our cues from the building that we were in. And the story of Coney Island is really different than the story of warehouses. So it's another exhibition in a lot of ways. We do, we don't have like a whole section on fireboats, but fireboats make, are in the exhibition. <laughs> and I will task you with coming and finding them in the exhibition. Go, we definitely consider Gowan as part of the waterfront. Another story of an enslaved person that we tell is a young man, a 10-year-old man, young man named Frank, who worked at a mill um, called the Yellow Mill along Gowanus. So we look at Gowanus both before it became a canal, back when it was Gowanus Creek, when Red Hook was that kind of marshy swampland um, that was so perfect for flour mills and the like. Um, and then we also do talk a little bit about the Gowanus when it was dredged out um, and became a center of industry. And we talk about it at that point largely in the context of industrial pollution and the ongoing ways that we have to deal with the pollution that 19th century and 20th century industry caused to our waterways. Because we, 
<laughs> because we, uh, we, we are doing a, a, a focus on the, the 19th century and earlier, I did not include our oyster stories because a lot of those go into the 20th century. But one reason I would encourage you to come to see our exhibition is because we have a whole section on the history of oysters. And I'm sorry to do this to your white wine, but it's about oysters and sewage. <laughs> And the framework in which we tell this, the physical framework, is we actually borrowed um, 6,000 pounds of oyster shells from the Billion Oyster Project. Anyone heard of the Billion Oyster Project here? Oh good, I'm so glad that you have. They're a fascinating organization that are looking to replant a billion oysters in New York Bay as an ecosystem regeneration project to clean the water because oysters are natural filters. So we, we hand... I'll tell you, I and my team wash every one of those oysters, and they're up in a beautiful structural wall that you can learn about the history of oysters. And to, to what you were saying, there's evidence that when Europeans arrived here in the 17th and 18th century, that oysters were as big as dinner plates. Oysters, gro oysters grow as long as they're alive, and they, unlike us, like they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so um, basically, because we, we understand oysters to be like this big today, because we fish them early, right? But if you allow an oyster to grow for 12, 13 years, it will become enormous. And so there's, there's tales of oysters as big as saucers, yes. Oh, that's a really great question. Uh, I'm just trying to think about, so the answer is before 1799, um, no, you don't always see enslaved people in the census. Now that said, the census as a structure really doesn't take off until the 19th century, right? It's established with the, the United States. At that point in Brooklyn's history, we have the, the, um, the gradual emancipation law in 1799. So basically there isn't really that much time to measure enslaved people, if you will, via the census because we're already moving into this moment of gradual emancipation where more and more people are being emancipated, right? So there, there is a period from like 1789 or so to 1800 where you are seeing local censuses take the numbers of enslaved people living there. Um, so it's just this period in which um, the, the question of enslavement and the way that we're measuring populations are very much in flux, so we don't have an enormous amount of census data, data to support it. The short answer is Ancestry.com. The short answer is Ancestry.com. So you can plug someone's name into Ancestry and it automatically taps into a series of already existing databases, um, anything from you know, veterans records from the Civil War to bank accounts from the Emigrant Savings Bank to of course some more census data. So again, this is the beauty of the data. There are a lot of challenges to the doing research in the digital age, but this is the beauty of data in a di digital age, we benefit with ancestry because people are willing to pay for that. Do you know what I mean? So historians are able to kind of benefit from that. That's a good question. Ancestry is amazing. Good question. So um, there are many generations before me of Brooklyn historians. Um, there's a man named Henry Stiles who um, actually, to my knowledge, has really written the only big synthesis of Brooklyn's history, uh, but he wrote it in the 19th century. And he was one of those historians that was just painstaking with detail. And so any data that he had, he would go through and like he charted this, basically. He could tell you every single house that is depicted in here, who owned it, what took place in it. And then he also, I mean, you can literally see every name of every person who's depicted in here. I will plug a, um, like a, 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 a sister organization of ours, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, has a really wonderful exhibition there. Um, and they actually feature this painting and allow you to explore that chart and who is who. Um, so it's a great place to do it. Yes, sir. Okay, so this is my biggest challenge, the anything in the exhibit about question, but I can actually say yes to this. So one thing, one thing that we did, um, again, to appeal to that lovely young man, I'll actually show you, because uh, he's playing with it, him. So we wanted to give an acknowledgement to every neighborhood along the waterfront from Jamaica Bay all the way to Greenpoint. And so we did this by creating a magnet wall where kids can learn about the kind of the individual character of each neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, and so this magnet wall has kind of generic things, brownstones, piers, but it also has magnets that represent each neighborhood, including Fort Hamilton, and we have the Verrazano Bridge in there as well. And so then we tasked children with building their own waterfront neighborhood, and also older children to think carefully about what they put in their neighborhood. So we also have things like 
sewer outfall pipes, we have industrial pollution, we have a lot of the bad things that come with the waterfront as well. And so our young, budding environmental engineers can think carefully about the way that we design our cities. Yeah. Again, I only told you about the 19th century because of the scope of this, but we do a lot with the future, actually. So we have, I think, and we, we, so basically we said to ourselves, what are the pressing issues that will shape the waterfront today and in the future? And we landed on the two most important from the perspective of our, our exhibition is the question of gentrification and then the question of global sea rise, right? And so we have actually a section on each of these. We look at deindustrialization, containerization, and then the transformation of neighborhoods in a section called after industry. And in that section, we really wanted to allow the voices of Brooklynites to lead, and so we drew, drew heavily on our oral history collections. BHS has a remarkable collection of 1,200 plus oral histories, and many of them can tell the stories of job loss, but also rising rents in neighborhoods along the waterfront, the displacement of communities that have been there for a while. So what's been so exciting for me as a curator is to see people sitting down at those listening stations for 10, 15 minutes listening to the voices of people who tell those stories. And then we also did an installation called Rising Waters in which we interview local business owners, historians, scientists, politicians, lots of other people reflecting on the really material ways that global sea rise will shape our waterfront in the decades and centuries in the future. So come see it. The Mormons are the, like, you know, unsung heroes of ancestry, right? Like, the Mormons are the ones who are doing a lot of the digitizing towards the genealogical work. So do, did I have, like, any particular interactions with, the, with Mormons on that? Maybe no, but certainly they've overseen enormous digitization projects that make those kinds of documents available, absolutely. So an archeological dig did take place underneath our building, Empire Stores, in 1978. And um, actually a pretty well-known local ar um, archeologist named Ralph Selecki oversaw it. They pulled about 2,500 artifacts out of the ground. Um, those artifacts are um, stored up in Albany right now. And so one of the first things that we did um, when we started to think of the exhibition was think about how to feature those. And so when you walk into our exhibition, you will see an installation of about 90 of those artifacts on display um, that tells us two things, basically. Both that we can learn an enormous amount of information about people in the 19th century from the garbage that they threw out. Um, and we show people how you can learn things from oysters and pies and animal bones and lots of things like that. Um, and also, it reminds us that the waterfront, actually 70,000 acres of New York City is man-made waterfront, is landfill, including the land on which the Empire Store sits right now. And that has enormous impact for the issue that this man raised about global sea rise. Most of those areas are now zone one flood areas, very dangerous areas. Um, and it also is a story about real estate. It's about the creation of um, you know, capital from water lots, right? And so we basically use that opportunity to tell people a little bit about what it means to landfill and why real estate is so important in New York. It's such an interesting question and difficult question. So often in Brooklyn, um, people would take the names of their owners. Um, you see very different patterns in the north um, upon freedom than you see after the Civil War. Um, because the process of gradual manumission was, um, it was just more gradual, <laughs> if you will. Um, it, there was much more negotiation involved in the, in the obtaining of freedom. Not, that's not always the case, but it, certainly you have a lot of situations where um, slave, um, the people who were slave owners saw the way the wind was blowing and sought to off essentially offload what they saw as their commodities before that they lost worth, and so they would allow their, their slaves to purchase their own freedom, right? Now, I just think an important thing to, so many people would take the names of their, um, of their owners. Many people would just make up their own names, right? And you, so you see a lot of examples of that. Just because um, Frank or Bet or Harry or Neen's name wasn't listed there didn't mean that they didn't have a last name or that they didn't create their own last name or their own family name. Those are the details um, that are lost, right? That we cannot figure out. And that's why when we have things like um, the New Deal, for example, did this amazing oral history with the last generation of freed slaves after the Civil War. They did it in the 1930s. That kind of, um, that kind of oral transmission is invaluable to historians um, because it's the first 
intimate glimpses that we can really get into the nature of, of families at the time. I think one really important thing I just want to like emphasize about slavery in the North is that just because it was gradual and there was negotiation doesn't mean that it wasn't horrific also. Um, and that that negotiation wasn't wholly based on the financial desires of the, of the owners, right? So there is this long-standing kind of myth that slavery was more gentle in the North, um, um, or it wasn't quite as, as bad in the North. And from all the research that historians have done, that is absolutely not the case. It operated very differently, but was um, oftentimes just as brutal and in some ways more brutal. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so we have some really interesting records on Weeksville. Um, we have maps that cover it. We have um, a, c a collection of pamphlets related to Weeksville. Now, Weeksville has their own remarkable archives as well. Um, and they also have some really wonderful oral histories as well. And so we've actually been a partner with Weeksville on an exhibition that we still have up and they have up called In Pursuit of Freedom. They have one at their site and we have one at our site. Totally worth visiting if you haven't been to. I would say I love our institution, but especially the Weeksville one, because the Weeksville story is intimate and personal and, again, place-based, right? Um, and then we also are partnering with them on a project right now about the history of Crown Heights. Um, so they are doing oral histories. We're doing oral histories. We're sharing them together in an online platform. It's such a wonderful and unsung location. I just wish, if I, it's like when people are like, what should I see in Brooklyn? The number one place I say to go visit is, is Weeksville. Great, great question. So Weeksville is the first urban black community in America. So in the late 1830s, um, a group of black um, landowners, pretty wealthy people actually in Brooklyn, bought up a big swath of land, primarily from the Lefferts family, and they established an all-black community and it was a black owned community and it actually persisted for many many generations really until the mid 20th century um, but it has some uh, remarkable moments in its history it was a place where people sought people in Manhattan sought refuge during the draft riots for example um, it was a huge center of abolitionist thought and abolitionist um, organization and they and then basically it gets lost and is rediscovered in the late 1960s and early 1970s um, and basically brought back to life. So that would be an endorsement. I would, geographically it is in Crown Heights. I would encourage everybody to go visit it. Community Board 8. Well, l I will say this, landmarking saved the building that we're in. Um, and so that is worth, for instance, from a historical perspective, that is worth pointing out. So basically, the, our building, our, its last um, use, uh, usable owner were, was Arbuckle, the Arbuckle Coffee Company that was so dominant along the waterfront in the 20th century, 19th, 20th century. They sold it um, to a real estate company that then sold it to Con Ed, and Con Ed's plan was wipe it out. And basically, it became worthless to Con Ed once it received landmarking status because they couldn't lock it down. It was only worth the land, right? So were it not for landmarking, we would not have the building that we're in today. A whole other talk is about the challenges of landmarking, what it means for different neighborhoods. It means so many different things for different neighborhoods. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But just from a historical perspective on the topic that we're talking about today, it was an enormously radical movement in the 1960s and 70s that saved countless houses, um, countless landmarks. Lost, we lost a lot of other things as well. Um, that has had, at like so many things, many, many intended and unintended consequences moving forward in the future. I will stick around afterwards if anyone has any questions. Thanks again for coming today, guys. Thank you very much.